Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at a dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. While he was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout the district. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Some of you might know that Matthew is my favorite of the four Gospels. And some of you might know that one of the reasons why I like Matthew is because he is very, very picky. And in this particular passage, Matthew, I think, got behoodled. He is all over the place in this text. It is very challenging to preach this. So with the help of Jim Somerville, who is a pastor, and listening to some of what his thoughts were, I'll take some of what Jim said, some of what I'm thinking, and some of what I hope, in spite of our humanity, the Holy Spirit will be guiding. Now, I really, really like this. I really like how the texts that we see in front of us today bring us to this very simple conclusion. Go and learn what this means. Go and learn what what means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I desire when you and others mess up that you offer them what I offer them, and that is, yes, there's accountability. Yes, there's responsibility. But you forgive I've come to call not the righteous, but the sinners. Now understand, that's a free pass, but not one that comes without some accountability. Some people say, that's what they hang on to. I did it, I'm guilty, but your job is now to forgive me because that's what God demands of you, mercy. Well, that's not assuming responsibility at all. That's pushing it off. And that legacy of sin just strangles the future. But go and learn what this means. Well, I just explained some of it to you. It's not quite as simple as it looks. God does desire mercy. God desires first that we start with mercy for ourselves. That we recognize that we get a chance to do it again. And I don't mean do the sin again. I mean, you get a do-over, so this time, work toward the appropriate behaviors. I have come to call not the righteous, but the sinners. The only way to deal with what I've just said is 90 days of prayer. 90 days of prayer is the start of everything. And it's not just 90 days beginning here at St. John's on the day that we started a few weeks ago. 
It's 90 days of prayer anytime you feel yourself in need. It's a season. 90 days is a really great period of time to work through just about lots of anything. 90 days is long enough. It's not short enough. It's not too short. It's not too long. It's a perfect amount of time to hunker down. 90 days to get in shape. 90 days to stop smoking. 90 days to do whatever. 90 days. But never unaccompanied by prayer. A surrender to a greater power. A surrender to, in our case, a triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 90 days of prayer to go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. This is why I was on the phone with my eye doctor last night at 9.30. I was just curious. The Pharisees. Pharisee, some of you probably know, Pharisee means to separate. The word actually means to separate. So the Pharisees did exactly that in their lifestyle, right? They were the righteous ones, the holy ones. So they separated themselves from anything unclean. So it would seem to reason then that all the laws that they would write and all the standards and rules and regulations they would write would say you can't be near someone who is unclean because you are in and holy and righteous and they are out and they are not. So separate. That's what Pharisee means. And uh, achromatopsia is where people who are totally color deficient. It's a, it's a condition called achromatopsia and they can only see things as black and white. I'm just curious Do you think that the world has changed much in 2,000 years from the day that the Pharisees were walking around with a black and white thinking, a rule-governed thinking? Those who are righteous, well, that would be us, right? We come to church, and the sinners, those people, right? The ones in Oli. Um, How has that changed? Has it changed? So the solution is to go and learn what this means. I desire mercy. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. That's twice you've heard that today. You also heard it in the text. So if it's sinking in at all, what then shall we do? In restructuring who we are here at St. John's, in this time of assessment, Can we assess ourselves honestly enough, authentically enough to make sure that everything we do here, every area of our ministry focuses on go and learn what this means. God desires mercy and not sacrifice. Well, the only way that I can come up with doing that is to commit to 90 days of prayer. I don't know how to do it any other way because 90 days of prayer might give me a chance and maybe you too to figure out what we sometimes forget and that is we are saved by grace getting something we don't deserve in Christianity and being a follower of Jesus Christ we get something we don't deserve grace forgiveness Jesus asks us in this text to feel the pain of those who are on the fringes, those who are on the margins. I want that pain, Jim Somerville says this, to become your pain until you have to do something about it. Until you have to shut off the robes of righteousness and dive into that dirty water to see if you can save somebody. I love that quote. I think it's the word shut isn't really supposed to be shut. I think it's supposed to be throw off or something, throw off the robes of righteousness and dive into that dirty water to see if you can save somebody. So you can see what Jesus is really saying, what Jim's saying, what I'm trying to say is different than what the Pharisees were teaching. The Pharisees wouldn't say, dive in, get into the dirt and the muck and the mire with those sinners. They would say, stay clear. Don't let them touch you. Don't let them near you. You can't be because then you will be unclean. That's why they're upset with Jesus. Because Jesus got... It, it's really interesting. I think, I think it's kind of funny. Um, I came to save those who need all the help they can get, is what Jesus says. And, and if you look at the text today, Jesus breaks all the rules. This is the Son of God. 
breaking all the religious rules. Tax collectors, he entered into their home. He can't be near someone that's unclean. He can't enter the home of someone unclean. He can't do that, but the rules give him a seven-day quarantine. So for seven days, Jesus himself, the Son of God, can't go into the temple and worship God. Is anybody saying, this is nuts? I mean, does this sound like television right now or social media? It's crazy. It, it, this should be a movie. Like, there ought to be a real Jesus. I'm joking. Jesus breaks the rules. A leader of the synagogue, a Jewish leader of the synagogue, comes to the one who has declared himself to be the Son of God after his daughter has died. This is, you know how parents, that have, they trick their kids when they're little. You're driving down the road and there's a dead deer. Oh, the deer is sleeping. There's a squirrel that just got squished. Oh, he's just sleeping by the side of the road. Any of you ever do that to your kid? Jesus just did that, right? She's not dead. She's sleeping. She was dead. A leader of the synagogue Ask Jesus, the Son of God, what can you do? And after they left the room, after people vacated the space, after the doubters and the disbelievers and the ones that were making a mess of the world and everything that God had intended, she walked out with her Lord. Jesus breaks the rules and so should we. The apostles remembered what many modern Christians tend to forget. That what makes the gospel offensive isn't who it keeps out. The gospel is offensive because of who it lets in. It's typically the person we think shouldn't get in. Because you know I'm a better Christian than you because I went to seminary. I'm a better Christian than you because I can quote Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I know the New Testament scriptures, and I used to be able to. I can't remember that anymore, but I used to be able to read, recite whole chapters in the New Testament. Whoop-de-ding-dong. That made me no sooner close to God. <laughs> yeah. The funny thing, it's funny, isn't it, that you can preach a judgmental, and vengeful and angry God. And nobody really actually minds. But you start preaching a God that is too accepting, too loving, too forgiving, too merciful, too kind. And you get in trouble. I got in trouble the other day. <laughs> Surprising. One of our community leaders was hesitant. They heard about the candidates' night. When we sponsored the candidates' night for those that were running for election for school board. I have never been called a liberal in my whole life. I have never been called a liberal until I came to town. I guess it's all a matter of comparison. What is liberal? What is conservative? Those two terms are the least helpful terms I've ever heard in decades. I do not find them helpful terms. I find helping people, if that's liberal, then I'm a capital L. If trying to serve the weak and the vulnerable makes me liberal, then I'm a gigantic, bold, typefaced L. If seeking to help others and sacrificing and being generous and being authentic and being intentional, I just think it's a big L. I think it's called love. So maybe that's what that word really means, to love. 90 days of prayer. The call has gone out. The call has gone out. Communication is super critical. You know it, and I know it. 
Because what we say, how we say it, how we express it. How many of you have ever been in the presence of someone and you listen to what they're saying and as they're going along, something happens inside of you and you kind of go, huh? and you think to yourself, what was that? If you take the time to pause and say, wait a minute, there was a spin on that. They just spun that just slightly in this direction, but it was enough that people followed them right down that path. But you caught it. You caught the spin. And that spin makes the world of difference of what you're going to write in your emails to people, what you're going to say when you're sitting down over a cup of coffee. It's what changes all because of a tiny little spin. See, I think that we are defined by the stories we tell ourselves. If we tell ourselves the story that St. John's Lutheran Church is a warm and friendly and welcoming place, and we believe that, the only way to confirm it is to ask those who come through our doors, have you found us, have you found us to be a warm and welcoming and friendly place? We can stay so caught up in our own little stories and our own little world. And that own little world is called me. <laughs> we can get so trapped in our own little worlds that there is no truth to our story at all. But if we create the stories, if we define ourselves as a congregation on the move, if we define ourselves as a congregation emerging and inclining our hearts toward the core values and our baptismal promise, if we together say, and see, I just said the magic word, if we do it, it can't be Alina saying, yep, and, and her mom is on the council, just to be clear, right? And she's sitting alone here because her dad's up here. He's working the sound booth. I know there's a head up there someplace. Where is he? There? Oh, you're over there. Okay, he's sitting, but you still see him. But, uh, never mind. You never see the other ones like, you know, Sarah Idol. You can't see her behind the screen. If, if we use we, they language... If Alina says about the Congregation Council, well, they said, there it is. You just got hooked and you're going right down that path. We, the people of St. John's, have a come-to-the-table ministry. We, the people of St. John's, you've never heard me say, I had a funeral. You've never heard me say, I had a wedding. You've only ever heard me say, we've had a funeral. Because I'm trying to teach you something that many of you probably don't understand, don't do, because it's been habituated in you. It's been ingrained in you to say, they decided. We don't really want to know what's going on in the inner workings of the church behind the scenes. We just want to come to church. We just want to come to church. They should be doing that. I will fight we, they all the time. And I can tell you that when we, they takes place in an email, I already know right where they are going. Because they are not in alignment. They are not in agreement. They are not we. Because when we fail, we fail. When we succeed, we succeed. You know what was so powerful about Friday night and Saturday morning? Because the worship team gathered and we, we worked together. We expanded our vision. We went from community Thanksgiving Eve service that years ago got moved to Monday. And then it started to fall apart. And so what do you do with it? Scrap it. Right? It doesn't work anymore. No. Think it through. Thanksgiving is what kind of a holiday? A Christian holiday? No. Chris, but it's a holiday nevertheless. And it is, in my opinion, 
sometimes it feels more important to me than all the others. There's a reason for that, because in it is the value of what institution? The family. So instead of trying to force people to come to a service and make people feel guilty because they don't come to the service, when they're trying to stuff a turkey and make all this stuff that I want to eat on Thanksgiving Day, instead of making people feel guilty and shaming them, flip it. Let's give them the resources. Let's give those folks the resources. Let's make sure every family in this church has a little sheet of paper that starts with a prayer that somebody writes. And then how about a litany that's a responsive reading? So everybody gets a sheet around the table, and Martha starts with this line, and then I say the next line, and then Mary Kay says the, th says the third line. I talk like Nutripoli now. They say that. And, and Delaney does something at the very end. So we work together. It's the we that we do it. And then let Maddie record a song. We'll have the words on it. And if anybody that has a computer handy, or I know a few of you have cell phones, you know, those little telephonic devices that, you know, you can do all kinds of stuff. But have it, so all you do is push the button. So every family in our congregation gets to experience Thanksgiving together. And what about the families that you don't have a partner anymore to go to dinner? You don't have a place to go. Do we really want those folks sitting at home? No. One of the best things I've ever experienced in my entire life, I kid you not, was my first Christmas dinner here. For the next three years, I blew off going to my own family <laughs> until late, late, late in the day. Because I wanted to be here with all the folks that were gathering here for the Christmas meal. So send the sheets of paper out to the people. Send it online. Have Maddie sing a song and let him play. Whatever we do so that we can be together. And let's have a few of us that say on Thanksgiving Day or on Sunday, the Sunday right after church before everything cracks open for Thanksgiving. Let's have a meal here. Let's have a little worship service here. Let's go right from church and go eat. Which one of you doesn't want to stuff your face with turkey more than once? So instead of having leftovers, let's have pre-Thanksgiving food. There is so much that we can do. We are defined by the stories we tell. That's what your worship team came up with. They made me call my wife. It, they, they, here we go. See, you can hear it. Did you see how I spun it? They made me. So now you know what's going to happen, right? Who's getting blamed for something? The worship team. They made me call Jean and say, will you do the prayer and the blessing for the back to school stuff? Do you hear how subtle the twist can be? They didn't make me do anything. We did it together. Baptismal promise, live among God's faithful people. Hear the word of God. Share the Lord's Supper. Proclaim, serve, and strive. That's what we say in baptism. We reinforce it here with these four core values. Authentic worship, sacrificial service, intentional relationships, radical generosity. Your congregation council said 90 days of prayer while we do the assessment. 90 days of prayer. We don't do it without 90 days of prayer. We're asking you to participate with us. In 2022, 2022 18 months ago, this was announced to everybody in the church. Authentic worship, intentional relationships sacrificial service and radical generosity it's in a letter i wrote the front sheet of the paper if anyone in our congregation if there's anyone on our staff that doesn't know this then somebody is not communicating someone's not getting the word out that everything has been planned years ago for what you're seeing happen here right now do you really think i do a heck of a lot without a plan I'm asking a question. No. But then I get excited about going in a direction, planning to go in a direction, and somebody throws a twist in it. Donnie Heimbach says, because he knows the building, Pastor Bob, we need to do this. So what do you think I'm going to say? Do you know how to do it? <laughs> and then what? Go do it. Why would we do it any other way? Why would we do it any other way? Why would we do it any other way? 
In 2023, we announced this plan, and it attaches to Matthew chapter 9. We just finished the retreat in April. So that every single area in our congregation, I am always shocked when someone says, I didn't know that was happening. I am shocked when I hear people say, I didn't know that was happening. Because we announce it months, nay, years ahead of time. And this is what we believe. That we're going to discern God's activity within ourselves, the community, and the world. We, we are going to discern God's will. We are going to make intentional decisions to participate in God's activity. And when we do that, we ask these basic questions. Like, what's God doing in our community and what's God doing in our world? How many of you went to the street fair yesterday? How many of you got a hot dog at the grill shop? How can you walk the streets without a hot dog from the grill shop, right? And then, as I'm walking down the street, being the shy one that I am, I saw Ken Hunt with the little, like, what do you call the beanbag toss thing? It's the beanbag toss thing and the holes in the thing. And this lady and her husband and this kid are coming up. I said, hey, I need a, to compete with somebody. Let's go. So she had her two bags. They both went through the hole. I have my two bags. Nothing happened. I said, I want to read a rematch. And we did it again. She put one through the hole. I put one through the hole. She put one through the hole. She won. And I said, hi, I'm Bob Mockham. I'm the pastor at St. John's Lutheran Church. She said, oh, that's our church. <laughs> oh? <laughs> And you know the rest of the story. So I said, I want to meet you. Come to church. I want to see you. But I recognized the kid's face. I recognized the kid's face. I want to see our people. But it's getting out in the community. You can't do it sitting in the pews. You can't do it sitting in the pews. 90 days of prayer is a big help with that. Finally, making intentional decisions. What time is it going to take for someone to help out pulling weeds? Where are you at, Will? Is Will in here today? How sore are your muscles from pulling those weeds yesterday? Oh, you're not supposed to say that. You're supposed to say they're not sore at all. <laughs> I saw him pulling weeds while we were in our retreat. How much money is it going to take to do something? What part of the facility do we need to use? Is there any education and training needed? Do you think Madison has a nice voice? What would it be like for her to learn even more about how to lead in worship? Let's send her to a workshop. She picked one. It's on the island of Hawaii. <laughs> Surrender all outcomes to God, acknowledging and celebrating the great things that the Spirit is doing. Because if you define yourselves in the community, then the people at McDonald's are going to talk about that crazy place up the road next to the state theater that says, wow, something's happening there. The Spirit is on fire. God is on the loose. And the way we do it is we integrate those four core values in every single thing we do. And we make sure that every single thing we do knows that they are to have those four core values integrated in it. And if they are not, then we have to realign them or we have to plus them up if they're already doing a great job or we have to remove them. That's the tough part because when you remove things, you got to deal with this. Access point for people to beat up on people. Anybody on social media? Anybody listening to what's happening in our country right now? You can get every flavor of beating up on somebody. And I don't like it. Do you? People who are in a perceived weakened position in a system act out through others to gain power even when it's not true. 90 days of prayer is the first step to being whole and healthy for the sake of the gospel. Join me in prayer. The Lord be with you. Good and gracious God, for the patience of this congregation,
to listen to a lengthy sermon, not only about how you were addressing our brothers in Christ, the Pharisees, and how you taught the leader of a synagogue to go to his knees and throwing out everything that leader would have ever learned, everything that leader would have ever thought or taught or believed in, tossing it all out because it was his child that needed the Savior's touch. And for this leader of the synagogue, I give you thanks for the example of sometimes all that we know and all that we have has to be sacrificed for all that actually is. Thank you, God. I pray this in my Lord and Savior's name, Jesus Christ. Amen.